In a moment, I'll pass it over to our speakers, Vanessa, who is the Chief Customer Officer of Achievers, where she oversees the global customer success and implementation team, as well as partnerships and revenue operations. Bree Harvey is the Head of Market Research for Achievers and works closely with their research arm and Workforce Institute, and I know they're going to share a lot of workplace science with you today. Over to you, Bree. Yes, thank you so much, Kat, and uh, thanks for everyone for joining us. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Bree Harvey. Vanessa and I are so excited to explore some insights and tips to improve manager recognition. And we thought instead of doing really formal intros, it would be fun to open with an interactive guessing game. So please navigate to your chat. Um, you can go ahead and trigger the poll. Uh, you may have heard this one. It's called Two Truths and a Lie. Uh, so Vanessa and I are each going to present three facts about ourselves, and you, our friends in the chat, are going to guess which one you think is the lie. So if you're ready, please give me a yes in the chat. I think there's a little delay, I'll go for once and twice. Yeah, so ready, wonderful. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna say three things. Two of them are true, one of them is a lie. Put the number of the lie that you think is the lie in the chat. Um, oh, we already got a guess, number three. So number one, I was bit by a trigger fish while diving the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Number two, uh, I cycled 700 miles up the coast of Vietnam uh, spontaneously without a guide. Number three, I was rescued by the Italian Coast Guard while sailing the Mediterranean. Um, I have two guesses for number two. Number one, Drew, you got it. I never got bit by no trigger fish. <laughs> I was afraid that would happen, but it never did. Um, Vanessa, your turn. Tell us your two truths and a lie. Put in the chat which one you think is the lie. Wonderful. Thanks, Bree. And hi, everyone. Really thrilled to be with you all today. So uh, one of these is not true. Uh, but the other definitely, the other two definitely are. So I was once rescued, truly from a pool of water, on national TV by a Baywatch star. Uh, number two, as a fellow Canadian, Justin Bieber, who hopefully all of you know, is my third cousin, twice removed. And last uh, but not least, I met my husband at a craps table in Vegas. Ooh, Some guesses for ones and twos here. Yes, so uh, those you drew, I think again for the win here, number two is sadly the lie. I do so wish I was related in some way, shape, or form to Justin Bieber, but alas, Canada is a very big place and not everyone is related. So thanks for playing with us. I love how you tried to throw off our scent, being like, my fellow Canadian. Um, that was fun. Okay, now that we are warmed up and Drew has won the guessing game, a uh, quick note about who we are, if you're not familiar with Achievers, we've been in the HR tech space for coming on two decades. We have a few hundred customers spread out around the globe that collectively employ a couple of million employees. One thing that makes us unique is we have a dedicated research arm called the Achievers Workforce Institute that publishes a lot of proprietary research about emerging workplace trends, uh, really in an attempt to provide the HR community with actionable insights they can use to better retain and engage employees. And today we'll be talking about findings from a couple of their latest reports. Uh, we'll be sending you home with a little to-go packet of reference material, including the latest report, some case studies, as well as this slide deck. Now, before we get into the good stuff, I want to get ahead of a, semant a semantical debate that sometimes comes up talking about recognition. 
recognition because there are so many different ways to recognize employees and define employee recognition. So I find it's helpful if we just clarify up front what we mean by recognition in the context of this conversation. You can think about there being broad strokes, three categories of workplace gratitude. The first being cash rewards. Think spot bonuses or any type of ad hoc reward that is privately and directly paid to an employee. Uh, we won't be getting into that can of beans today. Then we have informal praise. The key characteristic of praise is it's vague and it doesn't leave employees with an understanding of what they did to deserve it. Uh, so although praise can be nice, especially if it's coming from a senior leader, there's really not evidence to suggest that it's effective in terms of motivating or engaging employees. Um, then we have actual recognition, which is about describing what someone did and why that matters. Uh, recognition isn't just about celebrating big milestones. It's about noticing all the small things, acknowledging growth, and showing employees that you care about them and their success. So going forward, when we talk about recognition, know that we're not talking about private performance pay or informal praise. We're talking about the type of recognition that helps employees understand what they're doing right in between performance reviews. So all of the examples we're going to share come from our customers. So the benchmarks and the recommendations we make will be mostly applicable to those of you who already have an online recognition program or are looking to get one. But most of the suggestions also will be applicable, you know, even without the help of technology. Woo, Vanessa, I'm glad we got that out of the way. Did I, did I miss anything? Broad strokes? We got it. Okay, cool. Let's take a look, a little look-see at our list of things HR can do to elevate top-down recognition. We really tried to anchor each insight in at least one micro action because our goal is to leave you with at least one idea of something you can do within the next six months to strengthen your recognition strategy. Uh, I want to be clear, this is not an exhaustive list. This is not the only seven things you can do to move the needle on enabling managers to be better recognizers. But Vanessa, I, in, in terms of broad guiding principles we like to adhere to, I'd say, I'd say this list represents a pretty good chunk of the important things, would, would you say? I'm missing training. Yeah, definitely. But. No, I think this is I think this is a fairly comprehensive list, and of course, you know it's important to acknowledge what what you're doing today. Because some of these things are probably already working really well, and there may be others that you want to lean into, and that's what Bree and I are here today to help you with. The other thing to call out is though we know from the data that active manager participation is a vital part of strengthening your thank you culture. It's actually a vital part of any initiative you're rolling out. It should also you know, it's important for us to acknowledge that it's, this is really just one piece of the puzzle. There are a number of things that tie into great cultures of recognition. And of course, you can see empowering managers highlighted there. But when you zoom out for a second and you think about the overall, the, the broad 30,000 uh, foot view of what really moves the, ne the needle, excuse me, on creating that culture of recognition, you can see that there is other pillars at play, and uh, we've got lots of great content uh, on those other topics as well. But today, really want to focus on this idea of how do we support your managers? Managers uh, are people too, and they need they need our, our support and guidance. And most of this can actually be applied to other stakeholder groups too, executives, leaders of leaders, or even employees. Yeah, that's, that's a good call out. Like, even though we're going to be talking about all this thought leadership in the context of manager recognition, it's applicable to other stakeholder groups. Um, now, Vanessa, um, obviously each of these, you know, work best together and tend not to be effective on their own. But if you had to pick one of these pillars that you think is especially important to take heed to given the current workforce dynamics, which would you say it would be and why? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really tough question because you know the level of importance each of them may play could be very specific to each organization, and also as we just talked about some of the gaps that particular organizations may or may not have. But since you're forcing me to pick just one, um, I would probably go with the first one. You know, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek's work around starting with why. And while I'm not 100% sure he came up with the concept, he definitely could take credit for popularizing the idea that it doesn't really matter if it's a personal goal or corporate initiative. If you haven't really nailed down why something matters, um, it doesn't really matter how many reminders you said or, or, or excuse me, you send or how many uh, creative campaigns, things like that. It, it's going to be like a salmon swimming upstream because ultimately as humans, we really need to get in touch with that bigger picture and what truly matters. It, this is the exact same thing, same concept when it comes to things like workplace gratitude. If managers don't really understand that they have a pivotal role to play and their ability to effectively express that type of gratitude enormously impacts their team's motivation to perform, to stay, to give their to, to really give their best of themselves at work, then the rest of these other steps we've outlined will become won't be really as helpful. Yeah, and, and we're gonna get in deep about some of the steps on how to get there. But first, let's wake up our friends in the chat and do a little micro check-in with you. If you're with us, say hello, say hi. I think there's a few seconds delay, so hey, hey, hello, hi. Hi, Drew, our favorite friend in the chat. Okay, so tell us a word, or even a few words, the first thing that comes to mind, why recognition from people leaders matters? Like what do businesses have to gain or to lose by getting manager recognition right? Motivation. Yes, Corey, absolutely. Boosting motivation, your ceilings, my thunder. <laughs> we have a lot of slides about that. Any other benefits? Vanessa's like, don't get me started. Sense of purpose. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I have a feeling if you... I'm, everyone is typing faster than me, but yeah. this idea of leading by example, you know, m mirroring or, or demonstrating that behavior so people follow suit, I think is really important. And retention. Okay, you all get it. So um, you're probably already familiar with some of the research we have on the next few slides, so I'll make a really brief... Um, but yeah, there's a tremendous amount of evidence suggesting that the more grateful managers are, the more effective they are at engaging, motivating, and retaining their teams. Uh, they consistently lead stronger performing teams that are more engaged, less stressed, have a, a better sense of well-being, um, and so on. Uh, and HR not understanding the kind of critical link between manager recognition and broader business and cultural outcomes isn't the problem. The issue is that although when asked, an overwhelming majority of managers acknowledge that recognition is an important part of leadership, um, you know, 40% of employees still report being underappreciated by their leader. And unfortunately, this uh, kind of deficit in recognition uh, tends to disproportionately fall on the shoulders of HR. And we all know this is not the only thing on HR's plate. Uh, one thing I can say we absolutely get right as a business is our pre and post launch services. Vanessa employs a small army of support teams that are laser focused on helping our customers identify and solve for some of these gaps. Um, during implementation, we do a series of really in-depth change management workshops. And one of the exercises we guide new customers through um, uses something called WISM framework that helps us create messaging around, like anchored to a why for different stakeholder groups. So Vanessa, I would love for you to explain what WITHAM stands for and how it can play a role in motivating 
managers to lean into the idea that recognition is an immensely powerful tool to add to their tool belt? Yes. Well, the first thing I'll say is we have a very acronym forward, let's call it, culture here at Achievers. Plus one or thumbs up in the chat if you too have a very acronym forward uh, organization or culture. Uh, but we actually, you know, of course, we can't take credit for this one. This is really a marketing concept that's been around forever. And ultimately, it means what's in it for me. And that kind of goes back to what we were saying around the why, really starting with how it's going to be relevant to, the, to your audience, hence the marketing uh, origin. So if a salesperson wants a meeting with me, for example, to talk about a particular solution, he or she's going to have to find a pretty compelling reason to convince me that it's worth my time because, you know, lots going on. And this is the same thing for your managers. They're busier than, than ever. There's, I'm sure, a huge amount of things competing for their attention. And if they don't understand exactly how recognition is going to benefit them, it could just come across as yet another thing. Let's call it white noise. You know, a lot of customers take our advice. They hold listening sessions with their managers and other stakeholder groups to truly get an understanding of what people perceive to be their biggest and most costly problems. We want to avoid making any assumptions because we're really trying to change behavior. And a really good example of this is um, one of our manufacturing customers, DuPont. Of course, I'm sure a familiar brand, largely offline population, heavily male-dominated, blue-collar. Uh, that's the demographic. And, and prior to the launch uh, of their recognition program, we held a, a variety of focus groups to really make sure we understood what obstacles managers were encountering, not necessarily particular to recognition, but just in general. And we, we got a better sense for the misconceptions that they, the managers, had around this idea of giving a thank you. And so we were able to leverage those insights and create really um, targeted and, and tailored activation campaigns that centered around basically busting some of these common recognition myths. So it was, it was really delivered in a, in a we hear you kind of way. By 30 days after the, the launch of their program, they were almost at 70% of managers had adopted. And again, remember, this is a very offline, not tech forward type organization using a technology tool to try and shift culture. And you know, fast forward years later, they still hover around that 95% uh, mark with employees receiving over three recognitions a month. So truly phenomenal you know, to be able to work there. And it all started with, with listening and speaking to their specific needs. Yeah, it's a small thing, but it's also a free thing. And it doesn't take a lot of time and it can make a really big difference. Um, another kind of broad rule of thumb we adhere to when trying to garner widespread enthusiastic manager adoption entails going beyond a one-and-done approach when it comes to communication and training. We are firm believers in the rule of seven, which is a theory that suggests people need to hear something seven times before they will even, you know, consider taking action. So we're huge advocates of leveraging as many communication channels as possible. So, um, you know, we're being very deliberate about reflecting and taking the time to think where are the physical and digital spaces that managers spend their time so we could capture them in the flow of work. Meyer is a retail customer that does this, uh, I would say, exceptionally well. They run targeted email campaigns throughout the year, encourage managers to create space and spotlight recognitions during their meetings. They put posters and the break lounges, and uh, the proof is in the pudding. You know, 93% of their people, leaders, actively use their program each month. Uh, beyond that, we recommend looking for opportunities to piggyback on cross-functional initiatives or existing meetings. Uh, for example, you know, adding a segment on a company-wide company-wide meeting, a town hall, or cross-functional meetings. Um, one of our banking customers, this is a good example, uh, they were having a big leadership summit and figured since, you know, everyone was gathering anyway, they decided to just take 45 minutes out of the schedule to conduct 
a little micro workshop that covered the benefits of recognition and what makes recognition impactful. And just through that one touch point and coupling it with a short campaign, um, we found the following weeks, they saw an 88% increase in recognition sent by managers and a 1700 increase in overall non-monetary recognition across the board, which was like so high, we had to triple check our math on that. And yes, Zulima, I hope I said that right, the slides will be available. Yes. Vanessa, is yeah, that right? Your point. Yeah, to your point, we, we definitely always double check the, the math when we're doing any kind of uh, course data analysis work. But you know what, it's actually not that uncommon for us to see really dramatic results, especially considering where people, you know, the, the type of activity or culture they may, have, they may be coming from. And of course, incorporating a little friendly competition amongst leaders, which is, which is what we did there, never hurts either. And, you know, we've got a lot of really cool um, organization-specific examples around this. There's, there's no shortage of creativity I shared in the chat. For those of you reading that when we talk about communication, one of our customers told us their best communication vehicle is when they is when they post memos on the back of the bathroom stall door. So really it can be it can be anywhere. This is a great example of a of an corporate social responsibility component um, around Earth Day. And you, you know, this there's actually a question in the QA, if this might be a good time to to raise it, because it's related from Edric around what metrics and factors do you use when implementing a recognition initiative, for example, with DuPont. Um, this is something similar to it. It's, again, somewhat organization specific. There are definitely KPIs, key performance indicators that most customers look at. Those would be things around retention, employee engagement, um, uh, the idea of perform anything related to productivity or performance. But then industry specific, we might see things like this one. And in the case of DuPont as well, there's, there's definitely a, a safety component to it. This is actually a, a healthcare customer, and I was doing a fireside chat with their CHRO, and she shared a really neat story about how the team partnered with a specific task force within the organization that was set up specifically to reduce, excuse me, to reduce safety incidents. Um, you know, a common um, challenge in healthcare, and what they did was they they were trying to really promote this idea that they could they could thrive better, their employees could thrive better in a really high trust environment. And so what they did is they ran a month-long campaign encouraging their employees to talk about and celebrate what they call near misses. Um, you know, this is something that could have gone wrong but was caught ahead of time. And through that, they saw a 40% increase in this near miss report. And as a result, that, that dramatically uh, prevented a number of, of safety-related safety incidents as well. So that's the type of behavior uh, driving engine you can get through that concept of recognition when you tie it back to specific campaigns or initiatives that your organization is looking to address. Yeah, and it's easy to quantify the cost savings, right? Um, I love that example. Uh, and in the spirit of hopefully helping you translate micro suggestion into real world action, we're giving away a campaign lookbook that has about 50 turnkey campaigns that our customers have used for different workplace events and initiatives. Uh, it has a manager empowerment section. You're welcome to, you know, kind of use the campaigns or just thumb through the lookbook to get some inspo. I will say this is compliments of one of Vanessa's special forces team that partners with our customers to um, really elevate their communication strategy. Uh, this, the lookbook is a teeny tiny sampler plate of a much larger campaign booklet that they've put together every year for customers. So shout out to them, especially Leela, for letting us share it with all you fine folks. Okay, poll time. Boom, boom, boom. Pat, let's trigger that poll. We're going to switch gears to talk about best practices for measuring success. Um, and But first, we're going to get an idea for how you currently think about or measure the impact of your recognition efforts. You should see the prompt popping up on your screen. Uh, if you're like most companies, you probably use more than one of these. So try to just, you know, pick maybe, you know, the most important one or the primary way that you think about or measure the impact of your recognition efforts. Uh, maybe you use program usage data or benchmarks or uh, you 
just look at employee feedback or engagement survey results, or you look at turnover or performance or maybe something that doesn't fit into any of these buckets, or maybe you just don't have a formal recognition program or you don't measure the impact of it in a specific way. So let's take a little look-see at the results. Kat, is that, do we have enough of a delay? I'm like, how long is 20 seconds? I feel like that was enough time. Let me see our results. I see people are writing in both the Q&A and the chat, the Q&A panel and the chat. I was like, where? The... Okay. So we got the results. I am not surprised. Most, like almost half are looking at like employee sentiment or engagement. And then a third either doesn't have a recognition program or they're not like measuring it in a really deliberate way. Very interesting a nice mix um one of the, the most important steps that we go through when building a new recognition program with customers is talking about what success looks like so that we can align on specific and measurable goals that tie into the strategic priorities of the organization and when we're going through this goal setting exercise uh, or you know, doing program health reviews on an ongoing basis with customers, we find it's helpful to distinguish between two broad, um, you know, ways of measuring performance. You can think about there being tactical performance indicators and like more strategic and broader business outcomes. When we talk about tactical or program level performance, we're we're referencing things like you know. HR is going to be measuring such as surveys or usage, uh, but as programs mature, sometimes we're able to start layering in some more strategic measures of success and kind of think about what are the different ways we can capture how recognition is influencing outcomes such as performance or safety or whatnot. Um, and Vanessa, obviously we have heaps of recommendations and benchmarks for both tactical and strategic KPIs, but in terms of the tactical measures of success, what would you say are the most important to keep top of mind when trying to assess the impact of specifically manager recognition? Yeah, that's another another good question and also a, a tough one because the answer does depend on, you know, as you said, how mature the program is, Factors like where the what you know what the organization was doing before there there could be some industry related components as well. But generally speaking, our our major goal when we first go live with this type of pro program is monitor the, those more basic adoption metrics, things like how many people have activated their accounts. Um, we aim to see at least eighty percent. We set those targets for ourselves. In fact, my teams are measured on these targets. We are only successful when our customers. Are successful and we're pleased to see that on average 97 percent of all people leaders activate those accounts in the first six months and we also look at a, a really important metric because of course activating logging in that first time having that first experience is important for building momentum but then how do we sustain that so another key metric that we look at um, and this is at the beginning but also continuously through the program life is looking at what we call monthly active usage so how frequently on a monthly basis are people coming back to to leverage this type of, of recognition program? And we, you know, we again we aim for 60%, and we're pleased to see that we're crossing that benchmark at 75%. Once though a customer gets to those sustainable, pretty strong baseline levels of adoption, then we start to look at um, manager frequency. So how you know how often are the managers actually going in and actively participating in the culture of recognition. And through our Workforce Institute, the research that, uh, that we do is really consistent with what the broader community has found in that manager recognition is a key predictor and driver of employee engagement and pretty much any behavioral outcome, some of the strategic ones you touched on as examples already, Brie, that companies are looking to measure 
you know, really tie back to this idea of the role that the manager that the manager plays. We have a lot of examples like this one, which came from a retail customer of ours, uh, Coborn, where we found that locations who had the highest manager recognition levels had on average 40% lower employee turnover. And I'm sure everyone listening today can imagine in, in an industry like retail, how important it is to, to be on top of your employee turnover. This is another analysis we did actually with a tech manufacturing company. And here we found that their top performing managers, so those who exceeded expectations on their performance management matrix, matrix user scorecard, they sent an average of 40% more recognition than managers who were just simply meeting expectations. And so we see the same thing when we look at how manager recognition frequency is driving team performance. And although there's not really anyone in the market who would disagree with the importance of manager recognition and the frequency of it, there are some differences in the data when we answer the question, how frequent is enough? And I get that a lot when I'm speaking directly to customers, like, what if somebody recognizes too much? What will happen? And so we, we kind of throw it back at, at uh, in those conversations to say, well, what would happen? What would be the downside of that? There's some great research from you know, organizations like Gallup who suggest the sweet spot is once every seven days. Great Places to Work, another fantastic organization, their data shows that once every three weeks is, is the ideal. The benchmark that we recommend to our customers based on what we've seen work really well in the, the, the you know, almost 4 million people that are using Achievers today is to aim for 12 recognitions per employee per year. So essentially monthly recognition. Um, and, and having managers participate in that by sending at least two to four recognitions per month. Um, I, you know, again, ideally in that once a week range, but if not once a week, understandable, on average, two to four is a great goal. Yeah, how many employees have quit because like, yeah, I'm sick of this place. I get recognized way too much. I'm out of here. <laughs> and we have a lot of never heard of it. Yeah, never happened. Uh, we have a lot of customers like Meyer who average almost eight recognitions per employee per month, which is crazy because they have 70,000 employees that are almost entirely offline. Uh, we have customers who are so convinced by the bottom line benefits of boosting manager recognition that they've implemented recognition KPIs into their performance management process. Um, and I should mention that, you know, getting to really strong levels of recognition frequency isn't like flipping a switch. Uh, we're going to talk about that, you know, a few steps to get there in a bit. Uh, but first, I want to kind of explore a little bit more about how we can move beyond the world of employee surveys and usage metrics and look at ways to quantify recognition's impact on broader outcomes. Um, in terms of measuring how uh, manager recognition is influencing metrics that a senior leader might care about, there are a number of ways we do this. We'll mention two, and then we will go into the Q&A panel, not the chat, and uh, take one or two questions. And yes, Kelly, uh, this recording will be available afterwards. Um, so one of the first, and in my opinion, easiest and most reliable ways to um, look at strategic impact involves looking at the relationship between manager recognition and turnover. The example on the screen comes from a customer that has a really large uh, call center population in India. And for a variety of reasons I won't get into, they were dealing with a pretty brutal turnover tsunami. Only eight out of every 10 new hires were still there after day 90. So what we did is we sat down with them and identified where there were opportunities for trainees to experience small scale wins and progress within their first 90 days. And we ran a campaign to encourage leaders to publicly acknowledge those mini milestones and incremental progress more frequently. Um, and, you know, uh, new hires were getting shout outs for things like passing assessment tests or doing well on a training call. And, you know, they would see their name publicly displayed on monitors throughout the office instead of just being handed uh, a certificate at the end of training at 90 days. And they saw a 4% jump 
increase in new hire retention, which saved them a couple thousand dollars just in the first cohort of trainees. Yeah, I, I love that example because, you know, not only was there a, a huge monetary um, win for them in terms of their savings, but also the fact that those employees had just had such a better, uh, a more rich experience. You know, be so fascinating to follow them and see where they where they ended up or how their careers continued to thrive from there. Another relatively easy way to look at the strategic impact and something I mentioned earlier that a lot of our customers do sort of as table stakes is to look at engagement scores, probably something at least some of you uh, are measuring today. This is an analysis that we did for CVS Health, one of our, our longest standing retail customers. And what we did is we mapped their non-monetary recognitions that they were receiving to employees' engagement scores. And we found that employees who received just one recognition um, more a month were 43% more engaged than those who didn't. And we know from the data that engagement truly drives those business outcomes that we've been talking about. We have a lot of uh, really great examples where we see frequency drive both engagement and retention. We saw this with Horizon, and you can see a little bit more about their uh, results there around their reduction in turnover. And again, taking it back to the DuPont story, I didn't come full circle to finish telling you that where that those adoption levels got them was to see that dramatic uh, improvement in their safety scores. One thing, though, I want to make sure we're clear about, and, and not uh, this is sort of like a highlight reel that we're sharing here, is that not every customer has these sensational ROI stories, and they definitely don't write at the beginning. We have plenty of customers that are just trying to align their recognition strategies or bring their business units together. That's their step one goal, and over time, we'll build on that. And they see themselves at or above our benchmarks, and they see those improvements in the recognition-related questions on their engagement survey, and they're very happy with that, given, again, where they're coming from. So we always talk about taking this idea of a crawl, walk, run approach. And some of these uh, examples we're giving represent more of that long-term sprint or that, that triathlon or Ironman type uh, event. And so, you know, again, all part of the, the training that eventually gets us there. But it really starts at the beginning. We know at the same time that, you know, especially right now, markets are volatile, budgets are continuing to be tight. Everyone's being asked to do more with less. And HR is increasingly feeling this pressure of having to articulate the value of their people programs in a way, in a way that makes sense to their finance department, to their procurement teams. So figuring out how to measure what matters most to the business is becoming so important. And this is something that my team is always thinking about we, as, a, as a partner and as a trusted advisor to our customers. Yeah, and we wouldn't have like unbelievably astronomical customer retention rates if your team wasn't incredibly astute at guiding new customers through this process. Um, we have yeah, not easy. Uh, yeah, we have time for like I think one question. And to to clarify, Edric, for the Dupont story, and keep me honest here, Vanessa, the the metric that we were looking at is the number of consecutive safe days that, uh, like safe days as in not like safety-free days, but like uh, safety incidents that resulted in time off, like people having to, you know, clock out. Uh, so that was the metric there. And we have a really good question in the chat about like, how do we know that the relationship between manager recognition and engagement or whatever is causal and not correlative? Um, and, you know, my, my take on it is being able to, you know, we don't always know, uh, being able to say for certain that anything, like one thing causes another, uh, it requires a control group. And sometimes we can do that, but it doesn't eliminate the fact that when you're talking about something as complex as human behavior, uh, nothing happens in a vacuum. And so when we're sitting down with customers to, you know, have seen maybe like a 10% increase in engagement, partnering with us, uh, we have to be really careful when we're like writing case studies because although we know it's true that recognition most likely played an important role, we know that they are also leaning into other areas, other people's strategy. Vanessa, would you agree? It's like when we can get the A-B test, like that's the best, but sometimes we can't. Yeah. No, you're, you're spot on, Bree. It's so hard to do things like controlled experiments when we're talking about people. Um, and so we, we do our best to, to, to identify those 
correlations. And you know, one of our one of our customers, Kellogg's, actually um, the VP of Total Rewards there, and I spoke at a conference together, and he said something that really hit home with me and with the audience, which was, you know, I may not be able to say exactly how much of the revenue, uh, excuse me, of the turnover savings is exactly attributable to this program, but I know that without this program, we wouldn't have saved anything. So I think that's part of the conversations our customers are having today. Yeah, I love that. And one other thing I think we want to be careful about when talking about recognition frequency is we're not at all suggesting to go out and arbitrarily recognize employees. Uh, not all recognition is equally beneficial. Um, the quality of recognition matters a lot. And there's a lot of science about what makes recognition have maximum impact. And I always feel a little bit trepidatious when talking about this because I feel like these have been talked about so much, especially within HR circles. Like uh, the Workforce Institute has a really nice white paper that breaks down each of these in detail, which uh, we are going to be including in the link with all the follow-up materials. So if you want to go deeper on these, we encourage you to check that out. But we thought it would be more fun to just pick apart two micro actions for improving the rec you know, the quality of recognition. Um, so starting with a concept we kind of started to get into earlier, but it's a terrific little tip because it's simple and it involves helping managers understand the difference between praise and recognition. Leaders need to know that praise is like a vague pat on the back that doesn't leave employees with an understanding of what they did that was good. Uh, and no one wants more praise, not your Gen Zers, nobody. People just want clarity about whether the work that they're doing is correct and whether it matters and is valued by the people around them, especially their leader. So recognition should provide that clarity and help people see the link between their daily contributions and the bigger picture. And leaders should know that being specific in recognition is everything. It's their best opportunity to fine tune performance and communicate to employees that their daily grind matters, that they matter. And it's not complicated. It's, it's, a, it's a simple one-two punch. State what you observed and describe why it matters. What was the impact? Um, and I saw the chat and it disappeared. Um, okay, Vanessa, you're up for micro action number two. It's about the timeliness of the recognition. I feel like everyone, all of our friends here, already have the sense that recognitions should be timely. But what's a specific thing that HR can do to convince more leaders to send timely recognitions, Vanessa? Yes, this this has to be the, the million dollar question. You know, we talked about this earlier. Leaders are um, really busy. And like so many things that we've talked about, a lot of this just comes down to education and making sure that leaders understand how the principles of positive reinforcement are universal. So, you know, whether you're, you've just got a new puppy and you're training, you're training him or her or you're trying to encourage people to adopt brand new habits, the science is clear that the more timely the recognition, the stronger the emotional impact it has and the more likely it's going to result in, in some type of behavior change. And I feel like a lot of the leaders that I speak to in, in our customers' focus groups and, and different sessions have this sort of mental block where they feel like recognition is this super daunting task that's going to take a lot of time. But the truth is, it really doesn't have to take a lot of time. And Corey actually called this out in the chat. It's about describing the specific action or behavior, not just saying thank you, which touches on what, what Brie was talking about. And doing that, you know, knowing that that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a, a huge, that we're celebrating some huge big accomplishment. Just ideally what we're doing is regularly acknowledging, calling out those small scale wins and the, that incremental progress in a timely way. That's gonna be the simplest and most effective way to boost morale and motivation. 
Well, we know from the, the data too that when the manager is timely with expressing their appreciation, it communicates that not only are they paying attention, but that they're giving credit where it's due is a priority for them. So everybody knows their leader is very busy, but the fact that that leader took the time to, to step out of their very busy day and do that type of work, to, to send that recognition, to acknowledge that, that action or behavior in a really specific way, you know, goes so, so far. Um, Pre-pandemic, although definitely picking up again now, I, I travel a lot for work and I love being on site with our customers, but I'm also a mom and I'm always operating in a, in a time deficit. And uh, I actually looked this up just before we did this session because I was curious. I joined Achievers 11 and a half years ago and in that time, I have sent over 30,000 recognitions. I just looked at that and I couldn't believe that number, but I only probably spend you know 10 minutes a week on our platform and if, if you're a leader and you can't think of at least one thing someone on your team did in the last week that deserves a thank you, I guarantee you're probably overthinking of it. Or you might not have enough visibility into what people are doing. And that's another another area that we want to dive into. Yeah. And it, it could take, as you said, as little as 30 seconds. It doesn't have to be this big, grandiose thing. Um, very easy to overthink. Okay. Hey, so, so far we've talked about, you know, conceptually getting managers on board with recognition, enabling them to do it right, and measuring results. Our fourth and final theme we're going to close out with is going to address two program considerations that I find to be non-negotiable when setting managers up for success within the context of an online recognition program. The first having to do with the role of multi-directional democratized recognition. Because the reality of the situation is that even when managers and employees are in the same physical location, research shows that at best, managers have visibility into maybe 30% of the actual work being done on the front lines. Even when managers have the best of intentions, there simply aren't enough hours in the day for them to carry the burden of fostering a culture of recognition alone, which is why we're big advocates for businesses to enlist the help of frontline employees. When leaders go out of their way to convey to their teams that the business needs them to take initiative, to call out the good work being done around them and to amplify progress and when employees understand that they are the stewards of the unsung heroes among them, that's when we really start to see real culture transformation. Uh, Vanessa, I would love for you to talk to us about how democratizing recognition can help managers be better recognizers. Yes, I love this concept of democratization, especially in empowering employees to be part of the change of the culture shift. And, you know, for years, and everyone on this call, I'm sure knows, HR has been talking about the fact that the workforce continues to get more siloed, more geographically dispersed. And, of course, the conditions of the pandemic has, have left even more employees feeling isolated and disconnected. And that has really created this demand for virtual spaces where wins across the business are amplified and celebrated in some type of communal way. I can't under, uh, underscore enough how important this is. And so when recognition is transparent and democratized, like Bree mentioned, so the recognition flows in all directions, it's not just something that happens top down, it leaves more employees feeling appreciated and connected. And what ends up happening is leadership ends up having much more visibility, which we just talked about could be one of the problems, into the actual work being done. And it gives you all these golden opportunities to offer this, that, that timeliness, that immediate positive reinforcement of those exact behaviors you want to see more of. I, I lead a variety of teams across six time zones, and I'll say it's not really often I find myself with, with those spare minutes, but when I do, the best way I try and use that time is I just look at, at the app on my phone, I scroll through our live recognition news feed, and I start commenting on recognition. And I find out things that I'm not even aware of, which is so exciting to me because I have no idea things have progressed or um, you know, are moving along in such a great way. And I love this one particular feature, which is super popular with leaders and executives across our customer base called Boost, because it allows me to not only add my comments, but sometimes um, attach a small monetary value. And whether there's a monetary value or not, just leaving that comment conveys that even if I haven't 
heard of this project directly, or I didn't get to see it happen in person, or maybe I didn't talk to someone for months, I can still see them. I, the, what they're doing matters to me. Their work they're doing matters. And an extra benefit is even the person who sent the recognition feels more valued and connected because now here's someone else agreeing with their sentiment. So it can be really powerful. Yeah, and the, the thing we use is what gets recognized gets repeated, um, but especially when it's recognized by the boss in a public way. Uh, the last recommendation we have from a program configuration perspective has to do with priority prioritizing equity um, in, in terms of removing rewards, uh, the burden of rewards from managers. Since the pandemic, and even before that, a fair amount of evidence has surfaced exposing some inequities that exist all over the world with how monetary rewards are dispersed among women and minorities. Uh, recon recognition programs have been long enough that we have a fair amount of evidence um, that is clear uh, to, to conclude that when people leaders have the agency to select the reward amount that's attached to a recognition on average, women uh, and minorities receive less than men. And it's, I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that's here today uh, that it's not just male leaders, it's also female leaders that are giving, you know, allocating less rewards to minorities and other women. Um, and although we know that education can help with this some, we believe that the best and in my opinion, the only way to systematically eradicate that implicit bias from presenting in the context is implementing a standardized system of preset micro bonuses that are low dollar, think five, 10 bucks. Uh, Vanessa, walk us through how this recommendation can buffer against implicit bias and why the low dollar rewards that is advantageous from a budgeting perspective. Yeah, this is this is super important stuff. Um, you know, and there's a couple reasons why we recommend removing this this burden of these complex approval or selection processes for managers, and instead we favor setting up pre-configured, you know, think of it as pre-approved reward values for for that everyday type of recognition. Over the past 10 years, more HR leaders are aware of the fact that in tr extrinsic motivators, so rewards. They, they tend to have a limited impact on performance and they can actually be a bit tricky. We know firsthand from the data that when organizations overemphasize the reward element, that it actually can create higher levels of entitlement where employees feel expectant of those rewards or even resentful if they feel like they were given an award amount that maybe wasn't equivalent to, to their contribution. And, you know, through, this, through these years of data analyses, exploring these recognition patterns at hundreds of the organizations who use our, our recognition programs, we, we really found that embracing that idea of high frequency, which we talked about, combined with low dollar rewards, as Brie mentioned, five, ten dollars, and have those be preset for the leader to make it so easy for them, helps mitigate that idea of entitlement, and it also helps to decouple the reward from the recognition. So they're seen in the eyes of your employees as two separate but sometimes complementary things. So they don't always have to be together. The power of the thank you, as you've talked about so much today, on its own is, is, so, uh, is so important. And beyond that, we know from our experience that placing the burden on managers to have to make these complicated decisions about how much to reward employees, that probably, that we know that that leads to that earlier concept about how they feel like it's, it's really time consuming and really difficult to send recognition when actually we know that it can be really straightforward. So embracing these low dollar rewards also helps you stretch out whatever rewards budget you might have. I love this analogy that a customer shared last year in, in another presentation because it's just so simple. So let's say for example, you budgeted $100 in rewards per employee for the entire year. And if the goal is to make employees feel valued on this ongoing basis, see their behaviors, recognize them, make them connected and feel appreciated, are you going to be better off recognizing each employee just twice a year, $50 each time? Or are you better off to break that $100 into these micro amounts so employees are continuously reminded why their work truly matters throughout the entire year? I think that's definitely something that people want to think about as we're going into this next uh, phase of the economic situation all over the world around what, how, how to make our dollars go as far as possible. 
yeah, we're going to be operating in austerity mode. And, you know, there's there's no better way to stretch out the same reward spend, um, you know, it's just same reward spend, but over a larger volume of recognition. We are coming up on time. I sure hope you don't feel like this because we differ a lot. We're going to check in with you in the chat in a second um, and maybe squeeze in one more question. But before we do, we have our final poll, Cat. Let's trigger that. We are selfishly going to do some real-time market research and ask you to let us know which theme we covered today you found most valuable or useful. Um, you know, there's lots of micro actions buried into each of these. I'll just list off a few. Number one, we started by covering, uh, uncovering the data about why organizations that put energy towards enabling and empowering managers to get recognition right will have a competitive advantage over those who don't. Second theme we explored was how to get and sustain enthusiastic, widespread manager buy-in. We talked about starting with why, the importance of hitting leaders from as many angles as possible with a multi-channeled approach and looking for opportunities to piggyback on existing events, cross-functional initiatives, et cetera. The third theme we chatted about was um, all about measures of success and distinguishing the tactical from the strategic and um, how to articulate the impact uh, that recognition can have in a way that a non-HR senior leader would get. Um, and the fourth one, we had some fun breaking down how to enhance the quality of recognition, how it should be timely, specific, and so on. Um, and finally, we talked about some program design considerations that lead to successful top recognition from the get-go. Or maybe you found the program mildly interesting but not super relevant to the most urgent problems that your business needs to solve in the next year, that's fine too. We would still love to know, oh, Kat, we already got the, the results, nice. So most people like, what was it, D, what was the, D is what, five? No, four. Yeah, I'm enhancing the quality of oh, top-down recognition. And uh, that was tied actually with the second one, how to keep and sustain manager buy-in. Ah, well, I feel bad we didn't get go deeper on the quality one, but we'll know for next time. Um, very quickly, before you go, please, um, we're not done asking you for feedback. It would mean so much to me if you took 30 seconds to take our quality control survey and let us know what you liked about the program, what could have been better. Uh, we literally get our best suggestions from this audience. Uh, you'll get a link to the survey. We're also about to put it in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear from you on LinkedIn. Uh, if you have any suggestions for future topics, I'd love to hear it. Vanessa, I'm sure you feel the same way. <laughs> I couldn't, yeah, I was just about to say, I uh, I would love to stay connected as well. And if you do happen to check out that campaign lookbook that Brie mentioned and you find it useful, please let me know on LinkedIn. I would love to recognize the brilliant team that puts that together uh, every year and continuously keeps it update, updated in the face of our ever-changing uh, environment. So a huge thank you to all of you for joining us today and, of course, to uh, the wonderful Brie Harvey for facilitating such a dynamic conversation. We hope you have took some real nuggets uh, that and we'll take that back to your organization. I love it. Um, we are putting the look for, like the, the link should be in the chat. I'm going to put the quality control survey there. Vanessa, do you have a hard stop at, I know it's not 12 there, but whatever time it is there. No, I'm good. Okay. Cause I want to, I want to for everyone can, on the East coast. Yeah. Anyone can drop, but I'm like, let's, Wait, let's see if we can take one question because I see anyone, you know, thank you so much for joining us, but I, I say let's be naughty and go over one minute or two minutes and see if we, uh, the, the Lima, the chat's not, the link isn't working. We're going to get it to you in a follow-up email. Uh, if not today, then tomorrow. I promise you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and complain. Um, so the question I just love here in the panel is whether we have advice on how to get leaders to become more 
habitual recognizers when they're saying that they're too busy. And this this one gets to me because if managers are using the too busy card, it's a clear indicator that there's still a knowledge gap around why mm -hmm. recognition, you know, matters and there's probably more work to be done to shift perceptions. Um, you know, leaders don't get that it doesn't take hardly any time at all and that the returns on productivity massively outweigh anything else uh, they could be doing, you're, you know, you're just going to keep hearing the busyness excuse. And in terms of like specific tips uh, for making recognition more habitual, do not put a re recurring calendar invite. You're like, that's not going to work. I'm a big fan of BJ Fogg's work around habit stacking, which entails identifying existing habits and focusing on building little tiny micro habits on top of it. For example, I have a meeting on Friday, whatever, um, committing to take five minutes to look for and reflect on one thing my someone on my team did uh, that I think is a good demonstration of the behaviors we want. Um, it, it just, it could be teeny, teeny, tiny. Right, Dee? I love that. I love that. Yes, arbitrarily setting up a recurring weekly invite to remind yourself to recognize, while in theory sounds like a great concept, eventually just becomes noise. You just kind of dismiss those those meeting advice because you're relying just on discipline before the habit actually has formed. So I don't know, maybe that works for some people, but I love this idea of stacking habits and uh, making sure that people incorporate this into their into their regular ways of being until it becomes a brand new habit that they can share with other people. That's a great tip. Yes, habit stacking. Um, Kat, I'm going to turn it back over to you, but I really want to also thank my queen, Vanessa, for taking the time to be here and being so generous with your time and knowledge and all of you for joining us. This was really fun, right? I agree more. So the time just flew by, so hopefully everyone uh, doesn't feel like that image we, we showed them with, with brains spinning around. Uh, look forward to your feedback on the resources and on, and on the session. And... Uh, Go ahead and get some folks recognizing.